Welcome back, everybody, to the Three-Eyed Haven, the Grand Haven Tribune podcast, looking at the Game of Thrones uh, Season 8. Uh, I'm Matt DeYoung, and I'm here with... Alex. And we are going to look at Episode 2, and then uh, take a little bit of time to go ahead to Episode 3, um, which is shaping up to be a pretty explosive episode. But if we look back at Episode 2, I think what really stands out to, about this to me, Alex, is the fact that you know we had... Season 7, which was such a rushed season with so many things happening, so much action, so much going on. And here we are, two episodes, a third of the way through the final season, season 8. And everything's been a setup so far. It's been relationship-based, been conversations, but there's been no real action yet. No one's died. Nothing has really happened other than the fact that we've set ourselves up to know that the the enemies at the gates exactly um i think we finally get to sit down and have a drink with some of these characters and uh just kind of re-examine where they've come and where they've come as characters but also the fact that they've come from all these different places and different plots in the world and and now here they are back at winterfell where we started but uh, not as enemies this time uh much more as companions in the dark as they wait for the white walkers to come yeah so you talk about that and you know we'll hit on some of our our favorite scenes as we go through here and one that really stands out to me is sitting around the fireplace where you've got you know jamie and Tyrion lannister and you know you talk about the different backgrounds so here they are the rich people from castle rock who have you know had every luxury throughout their lives then you've got Sir Davos from Flea Bottom, right? Like the poorest part of King's Landing. Um, you've got Tormund Giantsbane, who's a wildling, and you know, that comes through as he's telling the story about killing the giant and guzzling his uh guzzling the ale and it's spilling down over his face and everyone's staring at him and it's like you forget, like he's raised above the wall and you know, these people are from totally different worlds, yet here they are all together sitting around a fireplace drinking wine in Winterfell, basically with the understanding that this is their last day on Earth. I think last, uh, the previous season, the best part of that was seeing some characters meet who's who had been completely on opposite mm-hmm. ends of the world for so long. And, uh, you know, watching John and Daenerys both rise to mm-hmm. fame and power and, and then to finally come face to face. And here you've got them all huddled together in these rooms and I just think it's so fun to see that yeah you certainly it really brought the characterization back to the forefront it really showed you that these are the characters that we've you know maybe despised a while back weren't so sure how to feel about them midway through the this uh, the series the series yes and now here we are at the end and these are all the people that we care about even Jamie Lannister, who's on trial at the beginning of this episode for all the sins that he committed, is accepted into the group because they realize, as John said, we need every man to help us fight. And even Bran, when he asked Bran, why didn't you tell them what I did? And he said, you're no good to us in this fight if they if they murder you first. And that was an interesting line because you know, you never quite know what Bran knows. Like every time he says something, you wonder, is he giving us a clue to something that he knows that we don't? I don't know if that's the case, but even Bran, who's not quite a man, but the three-eyed raven, is is saying, we need you here to be a part of this. Yeah, it seems like, well, we're not really getting, like, his visions or seeing what Mm -hmm. he's seeing, but uh, he doesn't seem to know everything that's going to happen. He's not in in control of the future, so he's involved in the... uh, that meeting that they have where they're looking at strategy and he decides to go into the, uh, what's that place called uh, with the tree? The Godswood. The Godswood. Yeah. And wait for him there. And so he obviously has an idea of how to do some strategy, but he's not omniscient necessarily. So we don't really know like what the extent of his powers are. You know, somebody explained it like this, like he's kind of got the internet in his head, but he needs somebody to do a Google search to figure out what to look for. Okay. I don't know if that works or not, but it's kind of like, hey, can you see this? Oh, yeah, I guess I can. Like, if, if you give him direction, okay. he yep. can see it. Uh, I thought that scene, you know, kind of the war council scene was what was probably the most interesting because at that point they're talking about 
the Night King and will he expose himself? We know he's got the dragons. And Bran kind of drops this bomb like, well, he's coming for me. And I don't think anybody knows that really up until he says that. Like, I don't think that was Who are really. You? <laughs> yeah. Why is he so important? But then I went back and rewatched because I'm that guy. Like, I went back and rewatched a couple older episodes. And I watched season six, episode five, The Door, which is one of the most famous episodes where Hodor holds the door as they're trying to escape from the walker or the, you know, the White Walkers coming through. And in that one, you see Bran in his three eyed raven land, wherever that is. And he's standing there and he sees the army of the dead and he turns around and the Night King's there and the Night King grabs him by the arm and he shocks him back into consciousness and he tells the previous three-eyed raven guy who's living in the roots under the tree like he saw me and the man says you're no longer safe here like he's coming for you and that's when they have to flee you see that's when summer dies that's when hodor dies all the children of the forest die it's like a terrible heart-wrenching right. scene but from that point on you realize the night walk the night king is coming for bran and then, then the way bran describes it is he wants to erase this world and I'm this world's memory. And Sam yeah. gets in and tries to kind of clarify it a little bit, but it doesn't really do a very good job of it. But what a deep like, concept that is to just kind of throw out to everybody who's sitting around here. And I don't think they really got it, but that was a, that was a pretty incredible scene and a pretty incredible setup for what we've got coming. I don't know if we got it either. Like, no. Who knows what that actually means? Uh, I hope that's one of the big questions that this show clears up and... Mm-hmm. Obviously, the Night King has an agenda. It's not as though the the White Walkers are just the embodiment of winter coming. Winter mm-hmm. comes often, yeah. but uh, they're up to something else, it seems like. Yeah, and this does answer, why now? Why are they coming now? Well, they're coming for Bran. The other thing I thought was interesting is Bran says, well, I'll wait in the Godswood for him. And they're like, you're going to use yourself as bait? And he's like, well, I won't be alone. And Theon says, you're right. I'll be there guarding him with the Iron Man. And my first thought was like, yeah, if I'm looking at anyone in the room who I want to come guard me, Theon's the last person. <laughs> like, I know he's good with a bow and arrow, but seriously, like, I'd rather have Arya, I'd rather have Jon Snow, I'd rather have Tormund, I'd rather have any of these people than Theon. But Bran just like, okay, cool, and no one else says anything. So I guess we've got, well, Theon. Well, I think that it makes sense for his character, though, because... He, he wants to serve the Starks. Like, mm-hmm. that's who he ends up finding out, like, who he is. He, is, he feels like his purpose is to come back to Winterfell mm-hmm. and serve the Starks like he did at the beginning. So yeah. I think he's stepping into that role kind of in a sacrificial sure. way to say, you know, I will guard you, I'll protect you. I think he's yeah. prepared to die even for them. And maybe we'll get to see that. But And that's an, another scene was the fact that, or, that he does come home. Mm-hmm. And so he was one of the last characters to finally arrive before this battle that's going to ensue. Yeah, and I thought that was really interesting, too, when, you know, you've got Daenerys and Sansa talking, and it looks like they might kind of be on the same page, and they might be friends, but then Sansa's like, but what about the North? And Daenerys pulls her hand back, and you can tell they're like, oh, okay, they don't like each other again. And then Theon comes back, and they go out, and Theon had been with Daenerys previously, like in King's Landing, and you think, oh, maybe she's like, oh, I've got another, you know, ally that showed up, and then he runs and gives Sansa a big hug, and you can see Daenerys' face kind of like, oh, man, like, I need a break to go my way, and this is all stacking up like everyone's on her side. I thought that was interesting. That's a great and, conflict. Yeah. It's really bet- there's the conflict between those two, yeah. but also Daenerys and, and Jon, so, yeah. yeah, that's, it's it's great to see some of that conflict knowing that they're going to have to put that aside perhaps for a little while here yeah absolutely so yeah that was great theon coming back was awesome i think another scene that we both agreed that was really cool was this you know back to that um hanging out around the fire drinking wine and whatnot and uh Tormund says to brienne well, what do you mean? You're not a knight? She's like, no, women can't be knight. And he's like, I would have knighted you a hundred times mm-hmm. over, which I'm not quite sure what he meant by that specifically. <laughs> Probably not the same you can thing. Read that, between the lines. Yes. But then Jamie stands up and he's like, actually, you don't have to be a king. A knight can make a knight. And he comes over and's like, Neil, Brienne of Tarth. And he like knights her. And I mean, it's like this super cool scene. And we clearly know, like, you know, Jamie and Brienne had this relationship 
earlier in the series where, you know, she's trying to protect him, but she clearly hated him. He was just the complete, absolute jerk to her, uh, as mean as you possibly could be. But then, toward the end, he does save her from the bear pit in the book. Um, and, you know, their relationship grows and changes. And now, clearly, she has feelings for Jamie. And you kind of wonder, because he comes back mainly because of what she said to him, you know, kind of forget about your honor. This is this goes beyond that. So this scene, I'm wondering, what are Jamie's feelings for Brienne? Because you've never throughout the season seen him really have feelings for anyone but his sister. But that's clearly kind of changing. And, I, and now, you know, I was waiting for, like, after he knighted her, like, you know, is he going to give her a hug? Is he going to do anything? And then he just walks away. So it's like, oh, well, maybe not. So I'm trying... Trying to feel that out. What do you think Jamie's position I is think, here? I think the more that he pivots toward Brienne, he's pivoting toward like nobility that you've seen from him sometimes. Mm-hmm. You first have this impression of him that he is conniving and and not to be trusted in any mm-hmm. sense and just really not a bad, not a good guy. Yeah. But occasionally you see these moments of of heroism, of sacrifice, mm-hmm. and and yeah, the more he, that he moves toward her, I think he becomes a character that you really like and so maybe yeah. that this is that moment it's it's more her moment but maybe this is sure. where we finally accept like jamie can redeem himself and and maybe he's good after all but i also thought that just seeing the the tears in brian's eyes was really powerful because yeah. she deserves it because she's been one of the truly good characters throughout, throughout the series yeah like the one if you can pick a character that's been on the straight and narrow the entire time done nothing but honorable she's that one she's maybe the only one yeah. <laughs> that i and, can think of yeah and that's clearly her moment but i think you're right like it speaks more to jamie's character than anybody because for him to do that for her was pretty cool i mean he had come up to her before and said it'd be an honor to fight with you and she kind of brushed him off like you've never spoken to me this long without insulting me get on with it but i think this was his like hey i'm serious i'm here i'm down you know i'm part of this group now let me prove to you that I'm worthy to, you know, kind of be in this. And, and for him to do that, and that, that scene was really cool. Um, the, well, uh, just on, on that, in that same scene, though, just uh, the fact that Tyrion was the one to bring them all together and hand out drinks, that's just his character through and through. That's who you see when you very first meet him. Mm-hmm. That's, that's who he is, is just bringing people together to have conversations, which... Is I think where some people get lost with this show because there's a lot of just talking and it. people mm-hmm. can find that boring. But I think that's where you really build these characters and get to know them. And and that's people have stuck through the show this this whole time. I think really appreciate just having those kinds of scenes. So perhaps for the last last time here. But well, and you're right because if you think about it, like okay, put yourself in Winterfell, you know. It's your last night alive for the most... You, that's what most people seem to believe is that the end is coming. Are you going to go to sleep or are you going to stay up with your buddies and throw a few back and tell a few stories, maybe sing a song, which we'll get to in a little bit. But you could totally put yourself in that situation. Like, I guess that's probably what I would be doing if it was my last night on Earth. And if it's not that, then maybe it's what Arya is doing, which right. is another big scene where Arya, the sweet little girl who has gone through probably... In a show that everyone's gone through bad things, Arya's probably gone through the most of it all. She was blind and completely helpless and alone yes. for so long. Uh, a half a world away. Right. With no friends. And also a little girl at that time. Yes. So she's in real life, but in the show, I mean, you see her grow up into an adult. Yes. And that comes in Enough to justify a scene like she gets in this episode, I guess. Yes. So. so yeah, I mean... There's been some hints that she and Arya might have, or this is, pardon me, she and Gendry might have a little bit of chemistry between them. But it did catch me off guard when she, you know, pulls him aside and says, if this is my last night, I want to know what it's like. And he's kind of like, whoa, really? And I was kind of thinking the same thing. Like, this is a little Arya. Yeah. What's going on? Like, and then she, you know, pulls off her shirt. You see these just vivid scars on her right. body. And it's immediately brings you back to, this isn't a little girl with no life experience. I mean, first of all, in Westeros, I mean, people are married at eight, ten years old. And, I mean, the the pace of life is certainly uh, 
sped up for the people in in this lifestyle that is portrayed here. And even so, I, I I think it doesn't really tell her age, but I think it's hinted that she's about 18 years old. So she's not a little kid anymore either. I mean, she's clearly a grown up. And that scene, I think, just really thrust her back into like, oh, you know, it takes her from that little girl to she's kind of come full circle where she's now, you know, as much a part of this game as anybody. I think these scenes can make the show awkward to watch with certain family members, but <laughs> uh, I think... At least in this case, perhaps not always with the show, but in this case, I think that uh, the scene was useful for her character, that it shows you where she is at this point in her life, prepared to potentially die in the next day or so, um, and that she's reached this, this maturity as well, but also to see her scars and to see that she's gone through so much and... And she's earned it. So. We should be happy for Arya. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and she's got her new weapon from uh, Gendry, which is some kind of a battle staff with a dragon stone blade on the top, which th- that doesn't get thrown in there lightly. Like We I, will I, see that used. Yeah. yeah. So obviously any any reference to weapons in this series has come back to be a pretty major reference later on down the road. So I thought the scene where Sam gives Sir Jorah Mormont his family sword was awesome. So... Obviously, the Mormont family sword was Longclaw. His father um, gave that sword to Jon Snow, and Jon tried to give it back to him last season. Jorah Mormont said, no, I brought Shane to my house. I don't deserve it. You keep it. Well, now here comes Sam with Heartsbane, which is another Valyrian steel sword. And there aren't many of them. It's made clear throughout the series that it's pretty rare. Only some of the top houses in Westeros have these Valyrian steel swords. The Lannisters didn't even have them until they melted down the Stark sword and made their own. So for him to give Heartsbane to Sojourn Mormont was, one, just a really cool scene between the two, and two, I think setting us up for just one more piece to the puzzle. I mean, we now have one more person armed with a weapon that's capable of destroying the White Walkers. So I think, you know, that's kind of setting us up like, you know, we don't expect somebody to do something really dangerous with one of these little handheld daggers that they make, right? Like you see a ton of them, but you're assuming that it's these major weapons that we've now have been kind of brought to know over the course of the series that's going to be the ones that are going to come into play as we go forward. It's classic fantasy to have weapons have kind of an identity or a name. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, I think they'll have to play a role at some point. Those are just a, a, a few more characters that have to have a story. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. Speaking of someone who has a story, Ghost, John, John Snow's wolf, hasn't been seen, I don't think, at all in, episode, or in season seven. We didn't see it in the first episode of season eight, but we did see him just for a minute on the top of the wall. He's just poking his head <clears> into the shot. <laughs> yeah. And I've read a little bit that I think the wolves, and I think I mentioned this last week, I really hope... That Ghost has a role to play going forward because they're such pivotal characters in mirroring the Stark kids all through the entire series that I think to not include them in the end in some way would be really disappointing. So I'm really hoping that Ghost has some kind of a role to play and, and becomes a little bit more active going forward to where he does something heroic where he saves somebody his his epic death saves somebody or something i have a feeling that that's going to come into play down the road um in this episode we also see a lot of preparations going on around winterfell to fortify the castle Mm -hmm. to get uh, an army trained quickly and just to prepare all these weapons and catapults and things Mm -hmm. to defend against uh, siegecraft and a big army that's coming we we suspect yeah. uh and and during that um we see uh Sir Davos have this moment with a little girl if you want to talk about that yeah which so Sir Davos is there and also Gilly's there and the little girl has a scar on the side of her face and that's a total reference back to um Shireen who is um you know thank you the, <laughs> that's a name i completely forgot so <laughs> Yeah, so it's Stannis Baratheon's daughter who was sacrificed, right? They burned her alive thanks to Lady Melisandre when they were 
like stuck in the snows as a way to get the gods on their side. And it certainly didn't work. And it was one of the most heart wrenching moments of this entire Game of Thrones ever to see this little girl like with her dad staying there stern faced as she's burning to death. And so you see this little girl and it's this brave little girl and she's got the scar on her face. So it kind of brings back that memory because obviously Shireen was very close to Davos, taught him to read, did the same with Gilly. So they both, without knowing it, had that interaction with her. And you see this little girl and they're like, well, you need to go down in the crypts. She's like, I'm brave. I'll fight. And they're like, well, the people down there need you down there to protect them. Okay, I'll take care of it. And it's like super cool to see this like little girl who, you know, this show has given us these little kids. Like, you know, you've got obviously Leanna Mormont. Yeah, uh, is, I was going to mention one. that she um, she's there in her armor as yeah. well, ready to go yeah. fight. Talking to Jorah, who you forget their family, they're related, they're cousins, right? Um, and she's like, I'm not going down there with the women and children. I'm ready to fight. And she's the one that's given Jon Snow a lot of first support and then a lot of grief when he came back. But, yeah, I thought that scene was really cool. And, you know, we all love Davos. He's another one that's really kind of been there through thick and thin, has been someone that we've really kind of grown to like and that scene with him was really cool and uh, a couple of i think we have to bring lord of the rings in now and again just because it's really relevant there's yes. a couple things um uh, i think uh the, the song from uh, podrick uh was very reminiscent of the scene in return of the king is it mary or pippin pippin who's singing during the beginning of a epic battle yeah and uh in this they're he see Podrick is singing while they're sitting around having drinks, and you see various castle activities going on, knowing that the end is coming. Yeah, so it's really interesting. So he's singing about Jenny of Old Stones, and it's like kind of a haunting song, and you're trying to listen, and she's dancing with the ghosts of old, and I'm not getting all these exactly right, but I did look up and kind of read it. And so this is referenced in the books, this this Jenny and this song. But then I guess the lyrics for this show were actually rewritten for the show to kind of flush it out a little bit more. But there's a ton of speculation, like, what does this mean? Because you don't throw a song like that in there without it being a forebringer of something else. Like, there's, it's got to mean something. And so my wife and I were actually talking about it. She was thinking that Jenny was Melisandre, who has been told that she's going to die in Westeros. So you assume she's going to come back at some point. I don't know if that, you know, clearly we saw the scene a few seasons ago where she is the old woman when she takes her necklace off and she's the shriveled old bald woman and like that really disturbing scene uh, to harken back to that. But I don't know exactly what, where this is going to go, but I thought that was a really, I mean, just a beautiful, you know, the song and the montage. You see Sansa hanging out with Theon, like this is their last night. Why did Sansa decide to hang out with Theon? Like... Is that something that's going to, you know, continue to move forward? Um, and then it moves forward, and then it kind of ends in the crypt with John and Daenerys, which was kind of the, you know, we've been waiting for this to happen all episode. Every time John was near Daenerys, it was kind of like the freshman who wants to ask out the girl but is too scared and bolts every time he's alone with her. That was kind of the scene this episode where every time Daenerys looked at John, he's like, I gotta go. And right. He's gone. Like he did not want to talk to her, but finally she bids him down in the crypt, and he has nowhere else to go. And conveniently enough, oh, who's that? Who are you looking at? Well, that's my mom. <laughs> what do you think of that? Yeah, scene? yeah, that was great. It's funny that it also took place in the crypt, uh, which is mm-hmm. where we where John found out this news in the first place. Yeah, a lot of things happened down there, um, but basically they entered. Now she knows that was a a plot thread that needed to be wrapped up. So the message was given to John, then given to Daenerys, and now the two people that matter to that uh, that storyline know, mm-hmm. but they're not going to be able to talk about it or resolve either the the political question or their relationship question mm-hmm. pro- until future episodes. And I, who knows if they'll have a moment during a battle to talk about it or yell at each other from across the wings of dragons yeah. but that will have to remain out there well it's really interesting because when sam tells john he says you set aside your throne for her would she be willing to do the same for you 
that was kind of where they left it, right? I mean, that was kind of the cool, the, the beautiful line by Sam that really and John's like, oh man. So then he tells her, and what's her first response? Well, then you've got a better claim than me. Right. Like she right away, she didn't goes say like, oh, we're related. Like, there's another Targaryen. Like, we're cousins or whatever they are. I'm, I guess not cousins. Yeah, she I, would be his I aunt, can't picture I believe, the tree, how, but yeah. how it would work out. But no, her immediate reaction was, oh, so you've got a better claim to the throne than me. And that's kind of... but she A did, threat. She yeah, sees that as a threat. Exactly. But they talk about, you know, that's all she's worked for her entire life is to come back and claim that throne, where John certainly hasn't. So she views it from a different lens than what he does. But it's certainly going to come to play. And, you know, that brings us to looking forward to this next episode. Boom. These White Walkers are lined up. Winter falls right We don't there. really know how many, though. No, that's one. That's a big question. Because it looks like there's, what, 10 or 12 in that shot that you see? We see a very brief partial shot. It's not a massive sprawling yeah. army, as far as we can tell. Well, obviously, the, the dead, the zombie-type creatures, there's thousands and thousands of those. But the whites, like the actual living, I guess, cognizant, intelligent beings that with the blue eyes, we don't know how many there are. Now, if you go back to where these come from, I think a lot of them, if it's if you follow the books and and whatnot, it's you go back to Craster's Keep and he has all his daughters and every son that he has he brings out and sacrifices to them. But not sacrificed by killing him. He like leaves them and they come take them and they show that scene where I don't know if it's the Night King or another comes and picks him up and looks at him and all of a sudden the baby's eyes turn blue. So I assume that's kind of where they're building the army of living, walking White Walkers. Um, I don't know if there's another source, uh, but clearly there's at least several of them, and and then each of them have turned these other creatures so that, you know, you saw the scene where John kills the one and everything around it dies, and that that was brought up in the War Council too. If we can kill the Night King, we kill the rest of them. But the Night King, you've got to figure, is not going to come out and make himself very accessible to their weapons anytime soon. <clears throat> I really am curious what we're going to see next week. Because I don't think it's going to be just one huge Lord of the Rings sweeping battle with everyone involved. Like, when you saw, like, kind of the what's coming up, it's small scenes. It's, uh, you know, Theon in the Godswood. It's John pulling his sword out in us. And, and, and it looked like a more enclosed space. It's not this huge battle. I think we'll get some of that, but I'm really looking forward to the little skirmishes that really kind of define what happens. I agree. Um I did love that shot, though, just of Tyrion looking over the edge of the wall. Oh, yeah. I mean, that, just just the look on his face really says it all. And the music that was playing with it, too, right. was, was really haunting. Yeah, I think, obviously, we don't really get any major CGI stuff in this episode. Not a lot of action. Uh, so I, I imagine that that is going to intensify in this next episode. But... Yeah, I agree that it's really... They're going to have to continue some of these personal stories as well. Uh, some of these personal conflicts. Uh, but see, I think... Uh, to, to mention the, the looking mm-hmm. look-ahead moment, though, just uh, Brienne's moment where she's... Uh, what does she say? She's got, like, the sword. She's like, like hold back. Or, like, yeah. oh, man, that's... We know that's coming. Yes. And so it's pretty exciting. Yeah, we know we're going to get the dragons. We assume all three will be out there together. That was one thing I kind of wondered at the war council. Like, they never said, but I'd be like, what are we going to do if that javelin guy comes out again? Like, how are we going to guard our two dragons from becoming more, you know, dead dragons? Because that would certainly, if I'm Daenerys, that's my concern is, hey, we've got these two ultimate weapons that can win this war for us, but not if we put them in harm's way. You've got to keep them safe and you've got to use them very strategically because you don't... I don't think you live without using them at no. some point. No. But you've got to keep them alive. So, yeah, they'll definitely come into play probably in this episode. But who knows? I, you've, so the the first two episodes were an hour-ish, I think. And then yeah. these, these final four are going to be, like, more than that. I, I don't know. 80, if, 80 something to 90 like, minutes. Right, somewhere in there. So, yeah, we're, we're in for something, yes. I think. Yes. So, clearly, you know... The word spoilers is used a lot in here. 
we're only talking about what's happened in the past, so there's no real spoilers here. But so this is a theory that I've heard. So this isn't a spoiler because I don't know anything. When I see like photos released from the next episode, I don't look at them. Like I don't want to know anything. I don't watch trailers. I don't want to know anything about what's happening. I don't really read a lot of but, speculation either. So we're just doing mm-hmm. that. <laughs> but I did hear this, and I thought this was kind of interesting that somebody told me while we were talking. They said their thought was that the Night King is too smart to go attack Winterfell knowing that that's where everyone's waiting for him. They said, what if he leaves a little bit of an army there to keep them busy and he's marching south to King's Landing where we know there's more than a million people. That's a million more lives that he could add to his army if he... Well, assuming, right, they're south of the wall. Does his turning magic work south of the wall or does it only work north of the wall? I guess that hasn't really been discussed. But I'm assuming that if he goes down and takes over King's Landing and all the people there, that they join his side and they're heading back up north. So That's why I mentioned that we only see a few of the White Walkers. Yeah. Maybe they'll throw us for a loop and say, oh, it's you know six or seven, they're going to charge at them. But yeah, that I, I like that idea and that could be the case. That would bring all of the stories together. Um, yeah. Because that, we feel... Otherwise, it, you really you really have this battle of Winterfell that we'll see, and then mm-hmm. we'll have to deal with Cersei at some point. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, th- I could see that being a possibility. Um, I guess, do you think any Starks or Lannisters will die in this next episode? You know, everyone's clearly embraced their mortality i think we've said goodbye to a lot of characters (laughs) i think that this is where the rubber hits the road and we have at least some major characters die i don't know about starks or lannisters just because you know we've got four episodes left we need these conflicts to last and they're so wrapped up in all these conflicts that if you take one of them out of the puzzle i think some of the story unravels which isn't to say it's not going to happen. We've certainly seen that happen before. But you almost want to see some kind of a conclusion to some of these storylines that have come along. And who knows? We might not get those. I mean, you know, I have absolutely no idea where this is going to end up. I don't think anybody really does. There's a lot of speculation. But if this battle takes place this episode, is this going to be the big battle? And then if so, what happens the next three episodes? So I've got to imagine that this isn't going to be a battle with a conclusion where it's wrapped up and you put a bow on it and we move on to something else. I'm imagining that this is the start of a conflict that's going to carry us through a few episodes. I think we're going to see some death. <laughs> I'll just say that. Yeah. Um, just to recap, I think this episode, like like you said, is a calm before the storm, which is a yeah. classic war trope, whether it's like Les Miserables or Lord of the Rings. You always get those moments with characters Mm -hmm. where they're just waiting knowing they're in the armor they're freaking out and they know that it's coming so it was good stuff i think yeah i mean clearly i thought i was happy with episode one i thought it was cool how everyone you know the gang's back together i thought this far surpassed it as far as the personal interactions that we got the relationship that we got to see between several of the characters and just the way that this set up i mean you couldn't have left a better cliffhanger than the music thumping and Tyrion looking out and all here they are and they see Winterfell in the distance and it's like you couldn't get us closer to the beginning yeah, of it no it's on I mean it's not like this is going to happen a while into the next episode it's like you basically fear the next episode and Game of Thrones does throw us for a loop there too because they always seem to find a way to jump into a different storyline like how frustrating would it what be what if we just go to King's Landing <laughs> yeah. for three episodes yeah if the next episode is all King's Landing like I think there'd be a people would go nuts. I think I'd have a hard time yeah. waiting a whole other week for it. Yeah. So hopefully it picks up the very moment that the last one ended. That's my hope. But, but of course that's not usually we what never they know. Do. Yeah. Yep. Great. Anything you want to add? I think we touched on all of uh, my notes. Yeah. I mean, I just think like we said, we're set up for what's looking to be a really explosive next episode. Um, I'm really looking forward to it. I'm hopeful that that happens. Um, And I I think we came out of this feeling closer to the people that we really have gotten to know. And it wasn't rushed. We didn't have the rushed issue that we've seen with 
uh, recent uh, seasons. No, we will look forward to Sunday night at 9 p.m. where we can watch this, and then we'll be back with you next week to kind of share our thoughts on Episode 3. We'll see you then.